Today, an interview in action from the Vive event down here in Miami. My name is Bill Russell. I'm a former CIO for a 16 hospital system and creator of This Week Health, a set of channels dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. We want to thank our show sponsors who are investing in developing the next generation of health leaders, Gordian Dynamics, Quill Health, TauSite, Nuance, Canon Medical, and Current Health. Check them out at thisweekhealth.com slash today. And now, on to our interview. All right, Vive 2022, and we're here with Ed Marks. I don't know what to announce you as. Are you like uh, a professional podcaster now? Digital Voices is doing real well. Yeah. You're, you're, you're an author. I'm just a journeyman. I, I learn from people like you and others, and, and your podcast yourself, and your, and your web presence, and I just copy you all. Former, former CIO. I mean, we got the author thing down. Um, you, uh, you're also doing a lot of work in digital, yeah. in the digital space, and uh, uh, I, I don't even know where to start. I want to start with the podcast stuff because stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. So, digital voices. Well, I, I, people do this to me all the time. I'm going to do it to you on air. I'm ready. I'm which ready. is um, coolest interview you've had so far this year? Uh, other than any that have you in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, don't don't worry about I, me. I got it. I got it. So. Uh, I don't think we released it yet, so it'll be coming out very shortly. But you know, I'm I'm writing a book with Chris Ross on patient experience, and so we've been doing a lot of focus groups, and especially for communities that are neglected without you know there's health equity issues, and so one of those communities is the transgender community. So I have a, a nephew who became my niece, and so I'm very sort of connected now with that community, and I want to make sure that they get the best health care. So. Uh, not only did I have her on a podcast already, but I had uh, a surgeon who does uh, sex change uh, surgeries uh, to help people who are transgender that want to go the whole way. And that was really interesting because you know it's not something I'm super familiar with, and and uh, but I'm very empathetic to and, and and appreciate it. And so just asking her about her practice and how it works and things like that was really fascinating. Well, that's the thing I like about digital voices. So the patient experience, the patient experience is so broad. I mean, you talk, you talk about one community, you talk about the uh, disconnected community. So I was talking to a CIO this morning, he's like, uh, you know, we've got a significant homeless population. And they come to me and say, what are you going to do from a digital perspective to connect to the homeless population? He's like, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, really. I mean, that's a, that's a, we have some connecting yeah. to, the, to, to the populations. First of all, we have to see them and hear them, which is digital voices helps right. with that. But then we also have to Really, I mean, get up, get in and among them, and talk to them, and see how they're they're interacting with health. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, a, a very marginalized community, and if we don't get them healthcare where they are, then we know when they do get healthcare, it's only when it's in the most severe situation, and which is not good for them or good for anyone. So I, I I know. So another great guest that I had was the chief technology officer, the first one for New York City. So she and I, her name is Minerva. She and I worked very closely together in New York City. What she did to address part of that is she took all the phone booths. Remember phones and phone booths? There's still phone booths out there? Yeah, they're, well, not the booths anymore, but the connectivity to the booths. So she, she took that and made wireless hotspots. So to the extent that the population has a device, and the majority, at least that she worked with, did, um, you can at least have a way for them to get telemedicine. And you can do RPM as well. So that is one way, so in communities, all communities had all these telephone booths at one time. So that means that there's some infrastructure capability. And so that's just one example of how to how to reach them. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, the urban populations are interesting to me. And, and, and uh, the sisters used to always say to me, I don't see how digital is going to reach the homeless population. So we, we actually did a, a study at one point and uh, the numbers were kind of staggering. Uh, the number of homeless who have some sort of digital device. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I don't remember the makeup or how they ended up with them, but it, it ended up being a way, and texting is pretty ubiquitous. Yes. It ended up being a way for them to communicate with the health system, for us to communicate with them. Um, but still, they're, they uh, they don't want to be found, so when they come to the health system, they don't give us their actual information. Right. Yeah. It's hard to it's hard to follow up and, and provide them the, the care that we want to. Yeah, it, it is definitely a struggle, so that's why there has to be policy change at these hospitals. So. And going back to New York City because we did care for it. We were, we were the public health system. 
So we did care for, for everyone. And we knew that a lot of people couldn't even speak, there's a hundred languages, so couldn't even speak the language, and no way was the EHR gonna be able to take all that information. So we allowed uh, a lot of aliases. So people who didn't want to disclose who they were, whatever, we, we came up with a way around that because they had to have care, and there was no way we were gonna refuse care for someone because they can't speak the language or, or that they have, uh, they're incapacitated mentally or otherwise. So we just made it, we just accounted for it, made it happen. So, focus groups. Talk to me about that process. I mean, the, uh, was it, you went into certain markets and listened to people? Did you do Zoom meetings? I mean, this was during the yeah, pandemic. During you were the doing pandemic. This. Yeah, we're still, we're still doing some, because the book's still in process, it's about 30% finished, and we're always discovering more. So, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of these focus groups. Yeah, so we realized that Chris Ross and I, if you know Chris, he's, we're both white men. Uh, and older, right, a little bit more mature. So we know our experience cannot represent everyone's experience. So we knew enough to say, look, we need to talk to everyone, marginalized groups, we need to talk to, um, you know, different, like the transgender community that I was talking about. So we set up these uh, focus groups, and some of them were general, so they were Zoom, the majority were Zoom meetings. And, and so we set up these focus groups and we were able to contact the right you know, organizations to say, this is what we're doing, can you allow us to, you know, are there people that are interested in speaking with us? And then we did the same like with CIOs. So I also wanted to get sort of the hospital perspective. And so we, we're both CIOs from large academic medical system. We have no idea what it's like at an FQHC. So we had a FQHC focus group, CIOs from those. Uh, we had a uh, small hospital and we segmented uh, medium-sized hospitals. So we really went after, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't remember, you know, 15, 20 different uh, groups that we went after to make sure that we get every voice heard when we go publish. Did you, uh, did you find there was a disconnect between what the CIOs were saying they thought the experience was and what people were saying, no, this is the actual experience? Yeah, I, don't, I, I would assume there is. Not, yeah. not, not because... Because we're so, we have so many things we're trying to do, we're so focused on solving problems like, I don't know, med rec and, and med adherence and those kind of things, that sometimes we don't have enough time to just listen to the community. Yeah. So I wouldn't surprise me. No, yeah, there's a huge gap. And you know, I thought I was pretty connected because you know, throughout my career, I know, you know Bill, I, I used to, my staff and I used to spend a lot of time rounding and spending time. And of course, we've all had family members. And so I thought that I knew what patient experience was, but until I was laying in the back of an ambulance facing the ceiling, it was a whole new ball game. And so it was the same way when, uh, you know, when I had cancer and you know, you're facing the possibility of death and, um, you know, and you're, you, know, you, get those, you hear those words, you've got cancer and it's, it's completely different. So everything you think you know, you, you don't until you're like, you're like at the mercy of the systems that you were overseeing. Yeah. And that's a game. That's a game changer. So we want, you know, part of the message of the book, even though it's being written for the consumers, so it's not written for healthcare. Although I'm sure healthcare will appreciate uh, the content of it. It's really, wow. It's 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 different. And we try to, you know, provide examples and sort of shake people up a little bit to really understand what that experience might be like. So how do health systems get better at listening? Well, so part of the of the book actually is to empower the patient because we're saying. Look, patient, you cannot expect, even, and so what we found in our research is, and I don't want to name names of uh, health systems, because, you know, right, right. let's just say health system X, you could have a good or bad experience at health system X, even if health system X is known for great experiences. So really, we're trying to help the consumer and their family and their friends and their broader network to prepare themselves to have a good clinical, uh, a good patient experience. So we found that patient experience is neither the, uh, has a positive or negative effect on outcome, but can it influence either. So, so, so quality is the baseline. Yeah. You expect a the best outcome that's possible given your condition. Yes and no, because if you don't fight for yourself, and I've had to do it, maybe you've had to do it, or fight for a family member, sometimes if you just take whatever's given to you, then you might have not such a great quality experience. So that's why we are really talking in the book, and very practical, like how do you sort of empower yourself, your, your, your ecosystem, so that you make sure you have a good experience, even so if... How do you advocate, so that's interesting. Because I mean, I've been on that floor where they're like, um, well, my father, my father all passed away, and different aspects of it, my wife and I are looking at each other like, okay, should we say something to the nurse? Should we, and you, you, you're sort of like, well, they're doing the best they can. Yeah. But I don't know if they're doing the best they can. Yeah, and I, I would not assume that they are. So. 
I love clinicians. I'm married to a clinician, and they're, they're God's hands of mercy and grace and healing. So I don't mean no disrespect, but they can have bad days or not so good days, or maybe they don't remember something. Like I forget sometimes some things. And so you have to really push in a very, in a very empathetic way back. You have to push and you have to fight. And I could, we actually give examples from both of Chris and my personal journeys about how we had to proactively take action. And had we not, we could have had a very negative outcome. And I, I hear stories about that in the focus groups a lot too, that if they didn't you know, get more involved in demand, you know, certain type of care or, or you know, uh, certain follow-up, it would not have happened and would have led to a bad outcome. So that's why, again, we, we're, we can do great things. And you know, that was the beginning of your last question about what can hospitals do, but I kind of flipped it a little bit at like, what can we do as patients and families and friends? Uh, because that's the most important part. The hospital, the impact you're going to have in a hospital is minimal for patient experience compared to what the person can do. But it's the two working together. So you, you're having sort of the top down, like what the organization is doing, but then what you as a patient is doing. Is there a platform, <laughs> this is a technologist in my <laughs> head going, is there a platform where we can help people to advocate for themselves? Is there a way that they, we could like give them a way to communicate with our health system to say, hey, I, I feel like this isn't going in the right direction. Could somebody yeah. look at this? Bill, that, that's, a, that's a great opportunity for some entrepreneur, for someone to really think about, because we haven't. So ours is very practical. It's very manual based because you know, not everyone will necessarily have the tools, but I think there is an opportunity for someone to, to take the model that we've created and really pr sort of automate it. And because it's so practical, I mean, you're giving me some great ideas in real time, so thank you. But it's so practical, like how do you build your network if you don't have one? Like, do you really know who are the, if I were to ask someone, who are the five, you know, like if I'm talking to a couple, who are the five couples in your life that no matter what happens to you tomorrow, they're going to be there for you. And they've made a commitment to do it. Hardly anyone can give me five. They'll say, they can give me one or two, but they're not five. So we're going to teach you um, how to do it. So I have mine, mine's called the Texas 10. These are five couples we meet all the time regularly. They are committed to our, my health and my mental health, my spiritual health. They're committed to my marriage. So like, if I'm struggling with something, I can pick up the call. They do the same, you know, pick up the phone. They, we pick up the phone for them. And so we teach things like that that really can make a difference. Fantastic. Ed, you know what I'm learning from you right now? I need more energy in my podcast. <laughs> My gosh, I, it must be the exercise and the whatnot. I mean, you have so much energy. We're on day two here. I don't, I don't know how you're doing it. I know it's been like four hour nights because my wife loves to club, as you know. And so we came here Friday night. I think we clubbed Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And last <laughs> night was like till two at some, you know, main bar or something. And did you exercise this morning? I know. So I confess, don't tell my coach, Ben, if he's uh, watching. <laughs> Three or four hours a night, four nights in a row, I just couldn't get, I couldn't do it. <laughs> so, Ed, thank you for your thank, work. Thank Appreciate you for it. all you do, really. Appreciate it.